Hi everyone, me again. Yeah, back here to bother you some more. And uh, yeah, here we go now with part two of the Ashcroft locking diff fitting. Now this one isn't going to be all about, you know, thread locking and torquing the bolts and how clean they need to be and making sure your ring gear is clean and everything. Because I covered that in the front. I don't want to bore you with it the second time, but basically just make sure everything is spotlessly clean. Get a really good quality brake cleaner. Um, clean everything thoroughly and then just before you put it together use a I use a cheap brake cleaner here which is like a pound of tin or something um, just as a final sort of just to make sure I mean, go over the cloth and if the cloth looks dirty start again um, you don't want any grease or muck or crap in that joint between the the actual um, diff casing itself and the actual ring gear you want it all nice and true so um, that's all done I've tapped out the threads the bolts are in solvent here soaking in solvent to make sure any old thread lock or oil or grease or anything's gone off them and then they'll be dried out, wire brushed and then they'll go back in with thread lock. I've got the diff in the vise ready to bolt everything together so I'll just show you what I've done. Um, what I'll do is take the camera off and um, show you just a couple of things I've noticed that you might want to be careful of. I'm not sure if you need to be or not but it's something I'm being careful of so anyway. We can see the diff in the vise and as you can see on the bottom here I've got a piece of cardboard I'm not, I don't have the luxury of having a workshop for doing mechanicals and a workshop for doing welding and a workshop for doing painting. It all has one. So, you know, this has got to hold this, you know, microscopically clean diff today and then tomorrow it'll be, you know, a two inch box section on angle grinder with some welding going on in it. You know, it's, um, that's how it goes. You can see all the bloody swarf around the bottom of the, the, the vice here. I should have cleaned that up. But anyway, the, um, the vice stood on a piece of cardboard. The vice. The diff stood on a piece of cardboard so that bearing down there stays nice and clean. And then you can see I've got the, instead of using those crappy 3 8 UNF studs I had before, I've got these aircraft bolts, these are 3 8 UNF, and a couple of sleeves just so that I can pull the ring gear up against this. And then when I put the thread lock in, if you know I'm a big fuss, I do not want to get thread lock in between these faces. I want it to be, you know, so I will put two bolts in, torque them up, or four bolts with those two. And then basically go around and put all the bolts in and then replace the others because I do not want to get thread lock in between these faces. Um, already we're, you know, we're up against it where these bolts that hold the diff crown wheel onto the diff actually come loose. So you know we need to give it every fighting chance. So we need to make sure the threads are perfect, the threads are spotless, these faces are spotless, the threads have got thread lock on them, on the bolts. So just make sure everything is absolutely spotless, everything's flat. I've stoned this face off. You know just to give it a fighting chance so um you can also see in here where i've got it i've got these bits of angle uh, aluminium that i use in the vice for clamping things but you can see i've also got a couple of wooden strips in here and that's because this ring here you can see this ring is free to turn and i didn't want to put any pressure on it with the vice jaws so um that's what I've, that's why i've done that so um i just spaced it out with these bits of wood i hope it's tight enough to hold it for torquing it up if it's not just tighten up some more but um there we go so that's just a couple of things oh the other thing is I've got a number one on here okay and then I've got a number one on the bearing to make sure I get the right outer with the with the right inner so make sure you number them up as well so they go back together the same as they came in the in the package so there we go uh, it's all been cleaned off with brake cleaner as I say all these everything is covered in like a protective oil obviously for uh, for shipping so uh, just make sure you clean it all but um there we go. It looks like it's got some special grease or something inside the diff, so don't go washing it all out with uh, paraffin. I, it's probably got something for bedding it in or something, I don't know. So um, there we go. So I'm going to get this all bolted together. Then we're going to get it in the diff and we're going to see if we need to modify these bearing caps to give it clearance. That's a, that's a whole point for doing this. And then once I've done it, I'll take it all out again, put this away somewhere clean, strip the diff, clean it all out, blow it all out, wash it out and then make sure that we, we go back together all clean again. I need to start then on those bloody shims again with the, the Rover Diff shim kit and get the, um, get the preload on the nose berries right. So uh, I'll see you in a minute, but probably like a day or two from me. Okay, so here we go. The, uh, the diff is in the, in the diff carrier, you can see now. And um, basically we've got the caps in. I've got about three and a half, fourth hour backlash. So we've got the backlash on the minimum, which means the actual diff itself is that way as much as it will go. So it will only get closer. And I measured it up and there is actually a lump in this bearing cap. I'm not sure you can be able to see it on the camera, but there's a lump in it about here. You can see here, the, the feeder gauge is like a brick in the top hat, but here there's a lump in it and it's 
that's a 15,000 shim and it's a 15,000 feeler and it's very tight. So I am actually just going to remove, remove that lump from the other side. In fact, I'll show you the lump and then um, show you after I've done okay, it. Okay, so here we go. Here's the um, the lump is here. I can't hold the I can't hold the thing and point it out, but you can see there underneath so underneath the B. You can see where it raises up. You can see where it's not flat there. So um, what I'll do is I'm going to actually mill that rather than grind it because I don't want to get loads of grinding debris in the air and stuff. So I'll just mill that off flat so it's sort of flush. Um, 15th hour is probably ample clearance but the problem is if I do get a bearing go, if you get a bearing start to rattle around and you hear it, you can stop in time and you can save it. I mean the only thing that would damage is the actual bearing itself. Whereas with that that close, if I do get this bearing collapse, that is pretty hard steel. This, this thing here is, is going to be pretty hard and it's going to gouge into this and put swarf in there. I may as well, I've got a milling machine, I've got the time, I may as well do it. There's no reason not to. So um, I'll get that done and then I'll show you what it's like after it's done. It's probably going to be tomorrow now, but uh, anyway, today is Friday. It's a lovely Friday evening. You can see outside, beautifully, we've got the van is in now. Um, just sort of let it open all the doors and let it air out and stuff. So uh, we have our own van, 2015, and it's got just over a thousand miles on it. Mm. Yeah, really. Hi everybody. Okay, so here we are back again, and this is oh, four or five days later since the last segment. And as you can see here, we've got the diff um, all together. But I've, I've I've reset the pinion and everything. I've done all the pattern. Everything's looking good. But I was having a real problem with the backlash um, variation going around. So I started checking everything out. And when I clocked the back of the ring, I found I had some um, variation in the in, in run out. Sort of. um, and what I basically found was rather than it just being, you know, run out from, you know, kind of like this. Um, it was it's kind of up and down. I don't know if you can see on this clock, but... Uh, it's kind of um, it's kind of not even, if you know what I mean. Um, but what I've done, um, I stripped it all down, moved the reel around, tried it again. I actually put the crown wheel up in the lathe to see if the crown wheel was actually bent, um, and I found the clock, you know, zero total indicator reading. So I know the crown wheel is not bent. Um, so obviously there's a little bit of distortion in the actual casing of the the locker diff. Uh, from the heat treatment, um, which is perfectly understandable. The actual variation is well within limits. Um, if you look in, this is what I was saying about Land Rover manuals. If you look in one manual, it says 3,000. Look at another manual, it says 4,000. So, you know, if we say 4,000 is the max, I've got sort of 2,500 here now, and I've got it going pretty even. So what I did, I actually stoned the back face of the... Um, crown wheel again and I stoned the actual mounting face on the actual diff itself um, and I did find a little tiny bump um, on the edge of one of the holes so whether that was giving me an issue I don't know so I would suggest if you are getting one of these just check you know I mean it is it's uh you know it's it's manufactured it's it's many many different parts put together it's an assembly and you know if if if, if an edge catches or something you get a tiny little edge you know, I mean, what we're looking for here is is, is a thou. Um, so I've now got it, you know, it, it was a four thou. Now it's sort of, what have we got there now? We've got, um, let me get this clock. What is going on here? Let's get the clock to zero. So... Yeah, we've got um, nearly 3,000, about 2.8 tenths, if you like, um, and it's going pretty even now. So I'm happy with that now. Uh, so that's why um, there's been this sort of wait, which is why you've had to wait so long from, from the installing the part one. Um, I have uh, emailed Dave Ashcroft, and he's been really, really helpful, sent me some information through and stuff. Um, and basically, you know, <clears throat> it's within spec, it's within tolerance and everything, and that's great. Now, I found another problem. Um, I think there's an issue with the manufacturer of this crown wheel. 
it's not enough that I'm going to sort of go and buy a new one because they cost a fortune. But um, the problem I have, I think, is the actual section through here, the crown wheel, is varying up and down. If I put a clock on this side and I clock the top of the teeth, then I'm finding that um, that bung keeps coming out. Um, what I'm finding is the there's a lot of variation and run out across the top of the teeth. Now, I don't know how when they manufacture this, if they manufacture to a depth or if they manufacture to a thickness. So if when they cut the teeth, they work to a section through here, so you put a ball in there at a specific place and work to a section through there, then it'll be fine because this is parallel. But if they work from the front face down when they cut the teeth and they cut to a depth, then that's why I'm getting the problems with the backlash. So... Basically, if you look at my front diff, the video on there, the, this, this face on the diff was actually ground on the ATB diff and was running perfect. It was zero. Um, this one's not ground. So I'm guessing it's because so many parts in the assembly, when it's all torqued up, you know, onto the crown wheel and it's got all the stuff inside, I guess you get a lot of movement and that. So, you know, as long as it's within spec, it's absolutely fine. But as I said, I think a lot of problem with my crown wheel. So... What I'm going to do is get it all back together again, um, get the pinion in, get it all torqued down. We'll get these bearing caps in. There's also a P washer that goes in here, sorry, in here to lock this um, this um, actuator. So um, I'll get it all together and then we'll look at the pattern and I'll show you the problem I've had with the backlash so that if you have the same issue, then, then you, you know what to do. And as I say, I've spoken to Dave Ashcroft um, I don't think there's many people that know more about these diffs than him and he's absolutely happy with everything I'm finding um, and apparently it's not unusual you know to have these rover diffs like this you know using all the tolerance and stuff my front diff was just absolutely a fluke and um, just very very lucky that everything's machined dead true everything's perfect and I've just been very very lucky so I'll get this together and then I'll show you what's going on. Okay, so here we are back in the vice all together. And this has become a real nightmare. It really is difficult. Um, I swear there is an issue with the machining of this crown wheel. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to use it. I'm not replacing it, as I say. So if we sort of check it out here, I'm going to try and do this one-handed now. So if I bring the clock in here to zero, as you can see there, you can see like here we've got, um, what's that, four and a half, five thou backlash, okay? So if I move it around here and then I come around to, come around to say here, this is just guesswork, I've got these lines marked all over it, that's where I was doing the clock in earlier. But we can see here we've got, um, that's about five. Come around here. They're on plus one, so there we go. We've got six thou there. It's one plus one to seven. Sorry, the light's reflecting off the face of the clock, isn't it? So we've got to be a little bit. There is one spot here where it goes down to about three and a half, four thou. So now we've got plus seven to plus thirteen and a half. So we've got like six and a half there. So as you can see. The backlash is varying as you go round. Now the other problem is of course is the pattern. Your engagement pattern varies as you go round because as the backlash reduces it moves the pattern up and down the teeth so we have to be careful of that. And of course the other issue we got is, is a design um, issue is we've got these stupid bloody pegs here so these slots have to line up with these pegs. So when you wind, if I want to increase the or reduce the backlash if I wind this one in, it has to go in by one space, okay? So if I go in by one space, I get down to about two thou in certain areas, which is too tight. So I come out I come out one and then take the slack up with this side and we've got what we've got now. So it's just going to have to do. Now, if it's noisy, if it's whiny, if it bloody breaks up or self-destructs, I really couldn't give two shits at the moment. I'm absolutely sick and tired of putting this diff together. Um... I have spent hours on it, you know, since the last little snip, snip I think it was three hours. And uh, it's just trying to get the pattern, the backlash and everything correct in, in, you know, and not just in one place. I can get it perfect in one place. I mean, you can see the pattern here. Okay. If I go around, 
with the pattern here it's completely different you see what I mean the pattern there if you can see it's not off the end of the tooth it's sort of almost the whole contact area if we come round to this one again you can see here it's sort of more down towards I don't know if that's the heel or the toe I don't know which is which but you can see it's down towards that end which which probably isn't right so you know this whole assembly is a is a mess um, but I don't know how good it's got to be to be honest with you I mean it might be absolutely fine but um you know we shall see luckily it is the rear diff so if it is noisy or anything it's not too much of a job to get it out and, uh, and sort it out so anyway um I'm going to put all this together now we've got these bolts when you get the Ashcroft locker you get these these bolts in this bag and this washer this washer type thing this P washer thing and that thing actually goes in as I say and stops that um, actuator turning and you've got two different length bolts so you've got a 60 and a 50 um, and the reason is I have a 65 55 but the actual depending which diff you've got if you've got dowels in here um, or not the length of the bolt changes so they're both M12 but uh, one's 50 and one's 60 I think and they're made to, to give you the extra length to take care of the you know where you're putting this P washer in um, so I'm going to put all that together and I'll get everything torqued down and then call it a day okay so moving on everything's all torqued up now diff is all back together and everything's done right so <clears throat> moving on now instructions that came with the with the diff which are very concise um, We've also got a box of goodies here. So we've got a valve here. This is a pneumatic solenoid. That's for the com for the compressor. So we don't need that now. We've also got our six mil hose. Now, one bit of advice I will give you: um, if you are considering using the existing breather hose, because you're going to use your axle, reboot your axle breather somewhere else or something, you'd, I wouldn't even contemplate it because if there's any debris or crap in that hose, it's going to blow it straight into your diff. So um, I would recommend using this and don't use the old, you know, the old hose. Not that you're stupid enough to do that. Um, we've got a piece of copper pipe in here. This is for our, um, for our, for our locker. And then in here we've got a, a little bag of bits and pieces now. We've got some switch faces here, front and rear, and the actual switch itself. So obviously we don't need them. I don't even have a compressor, so... I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Um, and then we've got some um, connectors there. So in the box now we've got some um, got some fittings, some threaded fittings. So we've got a brass 90 degree parallel with an O-ring seal. Um, that one's actually going to go into the locker itself. So we're going to use that one in a minute. So we'll put that one down there. we will put this one back in the box because we don't need it. Um, this one here and this one here look very similar. They're both 6mm push fit. Okay, and with push fits, the way to tell if you don't know, if you look on the end here, there's a number. And that number corresponds to the OD of the tubing that you need to use in there. So generally these days it's some um, 4, 6 and 8. Uh, you get some 3s and some 10s. 5 is also about, but 5 is no longer used commonly. Um, you can get 5 I can't think the name of the company now, but you can get 5mm uh, tubing, but if you have got 5mm, I would try and convert to 6 because this is all off the shelf stuff. 5 is no longer off the shelf. So um, the difference with these two, you can see on the bottom end, you can see here there's a difference in the bottom ends. This one is a taper. It's got PTFE on it, but you can also see it's got no lock or anything. It's just a fitting which is fitted to the plastic, whereas this one has got like a... a what I call it, it's still a fitting fit to the plastic, but it's got an O ring in it and a sort of nut, and basically it's a parallel thread. So, this one is designed to be used with this one and an O ring. Okay, so we've got a little rubber O ring here, we've got this fitting here, which is going to go into the diff, which is the uh, quarter BSP we tapped earlier, and that O ring is going to pop inside there, and then this one is going to screw into there. Okay, and that's going to give you the seal. So the O-ring is going to give you the seal around the copper pipe, and this O-ring is going to give you the seal around the top there. So if you are doing one of these, that's the way it goes. And what we'll do is we'll do it all now. I am going to use some a little drop of thread lock just to make sure nothing comes undone. 
um, and to seal these threads and save them weeping rather than use PTFE. This fitting here, put this back in the bag. This is actually when you come to use the compressor. And obviously this one here, this with the PTFE, the, the tapered thread, that one is also for the compressor. So that one can go in there. So all we need are the O-ring, the quarter BSP fitting, the brass 90 and the plastic push fit 90 and our piece of copper pipe. The rest can go back in the box and be put away to stay clean and dry and warm and happy. Okay, so I've taken this fitting apart now. As you can see, this is the thread that's going to go in there. We've got this O-ring to seal it. As I say, I'm going to put a drop of thread lock on there just to make sure it stays. Um, and then we'll nip this um, nip this lock nut down with the O-ring and that will seal it and everything. So that's all good. Now in here on, on this side where the copper pipe goes, we've got an olive, small olive, and we've also got a obviously a nut there that's going to put it all together. So in the book, what they're telling you to do here is to fit the fitting, put the copper pipe in, do the nut up, and then bend your copper pipe round, put it through your threaded hole at the top with this quarter BSP brass fitting in there, and then once the copper pipe is through the tap hole, fit the brass adapter nut from the outside and mark the pipe flush with the brass nut. Remove nut and cut pipe. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually fit this fitting. I'm going to put the pipe in and bend it and everything, but I'm not going to do this nut up so that I can take it out to cut it. And then I'd be able to blow it through and make sure there's no swarf in there and clean the end up and everything. So that's what I'm going to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is fit this. You don't need to see that. I'm just going to screw that in and then nip it up. And then we'll look at um, getting the pipe in and bending it. Okay, so that's fitted. Now I've got the nut on, but not the olive. So now what I can do is I can put the piece of pipe in. It's a piece of four mil copper pipe. So that can go in there. And then I can decide where I want the radius to start to sort of bend it. And it's going to be, I'll get a pen just to mark it. It's going to be roughly about here. So we'll have a nice straight run going in and then we'll bend it up and have a nice gentle curve in it. Um, I've got a pipe bender here, which I'm going to use. So we'll see how this works. Um, so obviously when this bends, it's going to bend sort of from here. So I'm going to put the pipe in and that's where the bend is going to start. So we'll just hold this up like this. We'll slot this into the 3 16th or 4 mil hole. Find my mark. There it is. So we've got my mark on there lined up. You can see the mark here. That's lined up now with that edge. Okay, so now we can just take this along. In fact, that's the wrong way, isn't it? Because basically that's what I want to do. I want it that way around so that this remains straight and this side is bent. So now we can just come along and pull this around. Okay, so I'm going to go to 90. Take that out of there. So we've got a nice 90 degree bend in there now. So that's going to fit in there. And then we want this to go around and up. So what we can do is put another, another 90. So we can pass that through there, okay, and then we can come along to say there. Now we need to make sure we get this distance good, so I'm just going to look at this and just eye this up. Yeah, I want it kind of nearly, com nearly a complete radius because I want to keep it away from the crown wheel. So what we can do now is just carry on bending that round. And we can push it around a bit more because it's copper it's so easy to so malleable it's easy to work with but the beauty of using this little bender you know you're not going to actually collapse anything whereas if you do it by hand you always run the risk of it getting a flat spot in it so a nice tight bend in there now just give that a little tweak and then that's going to go in there like that okay so bring the camera around a bit better so you can see a bit of a better angle there we go so that's going to go in there like that now it needs to be bent up around okay so because I'm used this is a very very gentle curve I'm just going to use my hand and now you can see why I haven't actually fitted this properly so that's going to go through that threaded hole okay and then we're going to have plenty of clearance so we'll put that up in there again so what I'm going to do is actually put that tweak in there so you can see I've put a a bit of a tweak in there so that, that can stay square in there and this pipe can be away from the diff so it doesn't get pulled into it and I want to make sure it's square when we get up here where it's coming out of the threaded hole 
Okay, so I'm going to put a bit more of a tweak in it there to keep it away from the diff casing. And a bit tighter bend there. We can pull that and you can see the kind of shape we got. So this is it's coming out of the fitting, up around, going over around the diff here and then down and under and then coming up out of that threaded hole. So, um, but it is very malleable. The pipe that Ashcroft give you is, uh, is very malleable indeed and it's lovely to work with, I must say. So that's coming out of there nice and square. So there we are. So that's that done. So now what we need to do is take our nut here and fit that into our previously tapped Ultra BSP hole. Which isn't easy because the pipe is trying to guide it for me. There we go, it makes it easier. Get that started. There we go. Wow, that is awkward. Right, so that's gone in now. So now this is going to go into there. Okay, and that'll get done up on the olive. So we make sure that Make sure that is square in both planes going in there. You don't want that to be going on an angle. Because um, we really don't want any air leaks. Because uh, it means your, your locker will sort of turn itself off while, you're, uh, while you need it. So. Just a case of tweaking it and pulling it and bending it. And what I'm trying to do is get it so that it comes out of this, this fitting up here that you can't see. This one here, I want it to come out of there square. So um, that's what I'm doing. So I'll keep fiddling with it and then I'll show you the end result. There we go, guys, that's it. So what I've aimed for is getting it to fit without it binding anywhere. So it's nice and slack in there. It's nice and slack in here. So it's not actually, you know, being pulled under tension anywhere because you want it to be square. You want the olive to cl clamp up nicely. You want it to be square here. You don't want it going against the edge of that metal, um, the brass fitting there and chafing or whatever. Because as I say, you know, anywhere from here back to your um, switch at your compressor, any leaks, that's going to form your, make your uh, locker come off. So there we go, not come off, but turn off. It won't make it fall out. It's not going to come out your axle unless you make a big hole in it. So um, there we go. So what I'll do now is, as per the instructions, I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm going to bring the camera up over the top. And we are going to mark, where are we? Here we are. We're going to mark the pipe level with the top of the nut. So now we just need to go just below that mark I've just put in there. And what I'm doing is, as per the instructions, you can see the instructions here. Okay, so you can see that and you can pause. And then you can see that and you can pause. So I'm going to do that and then I'll be back. Right, so piece of pipe is all cut to length and everything. So now all we need to do is take this nut off of here. We'll put the nut onto the end of there. And then we'll grab the olive. We'll put the olive on like so, either way around. And I'm going to thread this up into here. And I'm going to... Oh, I need to put some thread lock on there, don't I? In fact, we should be able to... We'll be able to fit that afterwards. So what I'm going to do is put that up into there and make sure it's all the way home. Make sure it's nice and square and then we'll just screw that up into there just like so make sure that pipe is all the way home give that a little nip with the fingers okay so now we're good there just going to square that up there and then this this fitting here we're going to get some thread lock on there and it's not to lock it it's just to seal it really Come on, just trying to get the thread locker to come out of the. Okay, that should be plenty just to get it to seal. So we can slide that over the copper pipe. I know you can't see what I'm doing, I'm sorry. And then that will screw in there. We'll give that a nip in a minute. We'll give that a nip in a minute. 
So I'm not sure what size that is. I guess it's going to be 10 mil. Yep, so we'll give that a nip. Just enough to compress the olive and then we'll connect it all up in a minute and we'll check that it doesn't leak. And then we're also going to give that one on the top a nip. I'm guessing that one is a 14. Yeah, I've got a 15 spanner, so it is a 14. Where did I run the 14 more spanners on? It's here, I've used it already. So there we go. See our pipes in there, so we can see we've got that fitting in there now. And we can see our copper pipe, and it's just sticking out the top. And it's free to move, it's not binding with anything, and it's pretty central in there. And this one's nipped up, so now we're good to go. So now we've got to fit a little o-ring down inside there. So an o-ring's gonna go over that pipe. I'm gonna need two hands to do this. Okay, so with the with the straight 6mm push fit, 90 degree elbow, pushing that o-ring down over that pipe, okay? So that's on like that now. And we're still making sure this copper pipe is free, it's not snagging up anywhere. And then we can screw this in. I think I might just put a drop of thread lock on here just to hold it. We do have an o-ring, but I just want to make sure. Spend more time on the camera shaking bloody lock type. <laughs> Redlock bottles than anything else at the moment. Right, so that's going to screw in over there just like so. I was, was going to say, I was hoping it was a swivel. Um, is that 14? No, that's going to be half inch or 13. It's probably 13. Maybe even 12. inch half inch fits so there we go there we are that's that done so that's in there nice and snug and I'm guessing what that's doing is compressing that o-ring at the bottom of the bore and helping to pinch the copper pipe in place and that can swivel so it's nice that they've uh, thoughtfully given us a swivel down there so I'm just gonna I want to make sure that o-ring is compressed so we don't get any leaks there we go all right so now I need to rig up some sort of test equipment and uh, see if we can make this work and see if it holds air right so here we go finally we're all done so everything's all done up I've now been inside and I've got a little old modelling compressor. This is a little old airbrush compressor I used to use. It's much better now. Um, and I've managed to get the 6mm pipe to go over this tiny little fitting on here. I don't know if you can see. A little fitting in there. So I've managed to get the 6mm pipe in there. So I haven't cut the pipe at all. And the other end is into this push fit here. Now, I'm not sure what the maximum air pressure you're allowed to... Or you're, is recommended for these. I'm not sure at all. But... Um, I'm just going to put like a few psi in there and see what see if it actuates and then see if it i just want to see that we don't have any leaks really in here before we close it all up so um i've got the shafts in here and you can see there i don't know if you can see but i'm able to turn them as it is like an open diff i can turn them individually so with it locked i shouldn't be able to do that so um let's get some air into it let's, uh, let's turn the compressor on <laughs> So that's 10 PSI, so what should happen now is when I turn this, it should, yes it's locked, I can't turn those shafts individually, so I, I'd have thought I'd have heard it clunk, but I didn't, but um, if I reach over, I can't reach over because the, I'll hit the camera, but it's come around this side, if I turn the air pressure, there we go. Sorry about this 
amateur guys. Okay then guys, I'll zoom the camera back in a minute so you can see what it is you're looking at. But basically I just want to show you the operation of this. Now this here, this is the, the, the clamp that's holding in the actuator. And the actuator stays stationary with the diff casing while the diff goes around inside it. So this is the beauty of this is, is the fact that that is not rotating. So you haven't got any external seals trying to seal the area like the, um, like the other manufacturers have. So if you look in here, you can see just down in here, you can see this chrome rod. If I turn the air on, you'll see it come out. Yeah, and if I turn the air off, you'll see it go back in. See that? Out. So that's locked. Okay, and then it's going to go back in. Now if I turn the shafts, you can't see what I'm doing, but if I turn the shafts kind of slightly off, then it can't engage. It only goes so far forward. And then when I turn the shaft, you can see it goes. So I'll bring the camera back so you can see what it is I'm doing. So okay, I'll turn the air on and it can engage. Turn the air off, it can't engage. But it's not engaged. If I just turn the shaft sort of 10 degrees, whatever, then it can't go in, but leave the air on, turn the shafts, and straight away it engages. So that's what it says. That's kind of what they, they tell you in the instructions is you know you should always try and use it when the wheel speed is the same. So if you're going down the road, down a straight bit of road at five miles an hour, there'd be no problem engaging it, although it's not recommended, it's better to stop. Um, but if you're actually, you know, in a ditch with one wheel in the air, don't try and engage the locker while you're actually spinning the wheels, because one wheel's not going round and one wheel is. So this is, this is what it's all about. And then if it's not fully engaged because they're not lined up, what will happen is one wheel will just spin just a few degrees and that'll allow it to... to um, to engage so uh, that's basically how it works and that is it installed so a little look around as you can see this is all just standard with the peg there involved in engaged holding that uh, ring in place and then around here we've got the the 90 degree fitting we've got the copper pipe we've got the fitting on the top there everything's put in with thread lock just to make sure and everything's all nice and hunky dory. We've got this P washer here, which is holding the, the actuator stationary so it doesn't actually turn. And then we've got the uh, the ring here. Obviously got the shafts in there at the moment. And then down in there, we've got the pinion. Here we've got the crown wheel. And there we've got the ash locker itself. So uh, there we go. This has been a bit of a nightmare. Um, and it's a shame really, because I was really, I've been looking forward to doing one of these for years. And it's really unfortunate that I happen to have a dodgy diff. Um, yes, there is a couple of thou run out in the in the locker here, okay, which there wasn't in the um, ATB diff. But hey, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. So yeah, a couple of thou run out, so it was like half the tolerance. You're allowed point one, which is four thou. But this ring is all over the place as far as the teeth go, and I showed you that with the uh, with the backlash and everything. So. I've got the backlash sort of running between four and seven thou. Um, if I bring it down too tight, I'm worried I might chip teeth or something when it all heats up and all starts to engage better. And the mesh, I'm happy with. I mean, you can see on here, you know, the pattern where the white is, is coming off onto the teeth. You can see the pattern is very even over the area of the tooth. So um, we just go over the best, really. If it does go wrong, if it breaks or whatever, then... That's another beauty of the Ash Locker compared to other people's diffs. If you look at the Ash, Ashcroft website, you can get all the parts. So if, for instance, this crown wheel did mangle up and it, it sort of smashed up all the casing and it was just the casing that was damaged, I could just buy a casing. If it does the end plate in, I could just buy an end plate. You can buy all the parts to go in the locker and then just rebuild it yourself. So, um, yeah, really, really good product. Uh, around about £570, pound, I believe they are, I can't remember now. But, um, you know, when you look at them compared to the price of the others, the others are coming down or have come down to, to kind of meet it. But um, I don't believe there's ever been an issue with them. So um, anyway, don't take my word for that. So I'm going to leave you there. I'm going to say goodbye. That's been part two. Um, the other thing we need to do is, is rig up the compressor. And I will show you in the instructions here all about that. I'll show the book here. So basically the first page is all about fitting that uh, we're doing that 
that tapping bit in there. And then we've got installing the airlines and it's given us the codes here for the solenoid. And then we've got the actual compressor itself and instructions on fitting the, the nipples and the valve and everything. Okay, so that's there. All right, and then it goes into fitting the copper tube. You've seen all that already. And then it talks about the um, installing the switches and everything and the wiring loop. And then we've got the um, how to connect it all up. Come on, camera, work. There we go, how to connect it all up. And then we've got final testing. Now, <laughs> this is the thing, it's telling you testing. I'd rather test it on the bench and make sure it doesn't leak or anything rather than, you know, find out I've got an air leak somewhere or a split pipe. Um, well, the torque settings are there and that's the actual diff itself broken up so here we go and then that's a list of the the parts you get with the set and all the codes and everything and then on the back of the manual there's also a list of extra parts you can get so there you go so there we are that's the uh, in info at ashcroftransmission.co.uk we'll give them a call on that number but um, yeah, I, re I thoroughly re recommend this. It's a beautiful product. Uh, it's got a hell of a reputation. Very, very strong. Um, I mean, it's going to break my shafts now before it breaks anything else. So uh, next thing I need to do now is get some heavy duty flanges for the ends. I'm waiting for Molly to send me the invoice for those. I've had the quote and everything. So I'm waiting for the invoice to come through. So we'll get four of those and then we're away. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you all soon with another video. Bye for now.